Section 6. Public and private qualia. So, qualia are present in both the public and the private spaces of conscious experience. But Gray points out that their functions seem to be more significant in the private spaces. He says, quote, Suppose, for example, that you are lying on the grass, gazing at the sunset. That simple act of perception of the public world starkly poses the hard problem. Whence the conscious visual appearance of the sunset? But there seems to be little, if any, in the way of executive function. No mental operations to be managed. You just sit there and look. Such simple, qualia-dominated moments are harder to find when one is not in direct interaction with the world out there. Purely internal qualia are effervescent or require just that special rehearsal of working memory to prevent them from becoming so. The exceptions to this rule, marching pink elephants say, after years of excessive alcohol abuse or a dose of LSD, have the smack of the pathological about them, end quote. Gray asks whether executive functions are, in fact, the dominant characteristic of private consciousness. If this is the case, he then suggests a weak and strong version of this position. In the weak version, executive functions are used to manage the contents of consciousness, for example, rehearsing a phone number clothed in qualia. In other words, the brain uses qualia to make consciousness manipulable by executive functions. In the strong version, executive function is crucial to the very existence of consciousness. Gray indicates a preference for the weak version by pointing out a. that executive function can occur without consciousness, e.g. a phone number can be remembered without conscious rehearsal, and b. that we can also have conscious experiences without executive functions. For example, just sitting and gazing at sunsets. Gray suggests that there are two distinct basic intuitions as to the neural basis of consciousness. The first and still predominant view is that consciousness is to be found in the neural machinery responsible for the executive functions, which manipulates information. The alternative view is that consciousness is based in perceptual systems of the brain. Gray contends that the two views are not incompatible. For example, once created, qualia can be manipulated by the executive functions whether a percept is in public or private consciousness. For instance, one can make an effort to remember the exact shape and colour of a flower when perceiving it in the public world and then later recall the flower from your private memory in order to describe it to someone else. But, Gray wonders, are the same brain regions activated when the percept is formed by visual stimulation in the public world, 
or when it is imagined in one's private world. If this is the case, then this represents a major difference between these two starting intuitions. In the first predominant view, consciousness arises in executive regions of the brain. In the second, consciousness comes from the perceptual regions of the brain. And I would also add the emotional areas of the brain. Gray considers three different origins for qualia, from function, from neurophysiological processes, or from quantum mechanical processes. Quote, In each case, there would need to exist, in the first place, some kind of a systematic relationship between, on the one hand, qualia, brackets, red, green, high C on the violin, the hum of a bee, the smell of a rose, etc. And on the other, variation in the chosen process, functional, neurophysiological or quantum mechanical. In the absence of such a systematic relationship, the starting point is a non-starter. For both function and neurophysiology, rather well-established systematic relationships already exist. So, for example, color sensations are well correlated with, on the one hand, the behavior of allocating color names to defined surfaces uh, function, and on the other, activity in area V4 of the visual system, brackets, neurophysiology, end quote. However, Gray points out that these relationships are just correlations rather than mechanistic explanations, and that while still wildly speculative, quantum theories of qualia might hold out the promise of actual explanation. Gray raises seven questions regarding the nature of qualia. One, what are they? For example, are they simple and singular as they are experienced, or are they complex constructs of the brain? Two, how does the brain produce them? Three, why does the brain produce them? given that it can perform so many complex operations without them. Four, what do they do? Five, how did they evolve? Six, what survival value do they confer? Seven, is it only brains that can produce them? Gray then says that, quote, no theory at present comes anywhere near answering all of these questions, nor even any one of them satisfactorily. An answer to question seven will almost certainly have to wait upon answers to the others. This is because in the absence of a general theory of consciousness, there are no behavioral tests by which we can distinguish whether a computer, a robot, or a Martian possesses qualia. Questions 1 to 3 are likely to prove the hardest of all. Questions 4 to 6 go together. If we knew what qualia permit an organism to do, that otherwise it cannot, then the survival value of this function is likely to be obvious, end quote. To conclude this unit, let me identify three themes in the theory of qualia which will preoccupy us for the rest of the course 
and also to try to come to some preliminary conclusions. So the first qualia theme concerns whether qualia are simple or complex. Complex meaning composed of possibly a large number of subcomponents assembled by a protracted period of neural processing between initial input at the sensory organs and the appearance of a quale in the mind-brain. Simple, meaning that the quale appears directly and immediately from first neural contact with the sensory input. Second, where do qualia originate from? Is the whole brain, or possibly the whole organism, necessarily involved in their production, or do they spring fully formed from a possibly tiny piece of neural anatomy, such as a, a microtubule? The third theme or issue is the relationship between function and qualia. Functionalism equates qualia with function. Gray and many others question this. Let me now give my own personal views on each of these issues. I believe that qualia are simple and direct phenomena and that they enter the organism fully formed at the very bottom of the nervous system, probably via the microtubules. As regards function, I believe that qualia are not equivalent to the major functions necessary for survival and reproduction. I believe that qualia have a special function, which is to enable learning and thus behavioral flexibility. In my view, this special function of qualia is as follows. Qualia make objects and the environment available to consciousness so that the affects, i.e. the subjective emotions, can evaluate them. The simple direct qualia entering the organism as sensation act as a raw material for other areas of the brain to process into representation with a qualic feel. The upshot of this is that all qualic experience can potentially produce positive or negative affects. These feelings act as rewards or punishments which consciousness can use to learn from experience, which in, in turn equips with flexible behavioral alternatives. What this means is that the function of qualia and thus of consciousness itself is to enable learning from experience. Without consciousness, for example, as philosophical zombies, we would only have our unconscious automatic responses to stimuli from the environment. We wouldn't be able to reflect on the qualic after effects of our behavior in order to either reinforce or seek to change it.